This video is sponsored by Established Titles. More on them later. Earlier this year, I built an RC hydrofoil boat that uses sonar sensors and a drone flight controller to actively control its height above the surface of the water. Then more recently, in the past few months, I've made a whole series of videos exploring different ground effect vehicle designs and concepts. In that time, I've gotten tons of comments and emails suggesting that I put hydrofoils on a ground effect vehicle. My response has always been that I don't think the two would be a good combo for reasons that I'll get into later in this video. But due to the large number of viewer requests, I decided to give it a try. Now this actually won't be the first time that I've tried to combine the two. In the first ever video of my flying sled ground effect vehicle from 2015, you can see here that I tried adding a little popsicle stick hydrofoil to the bottom of the aircraft. Now popsicle sticks with square leading and trailing edges don't make great hydrofoils, so this test can be taken with a grain of salt. I think my intention at the time was not to actually have it be submerged, but instead just act like a planing surface that skimmed across the top of the water. You can see that this sort of worked, and the aircraft was able to use the foil as a planing surface, but it didn't have enough surface area to support all the weight, and when the foil would drop down below the surface, the aircraft would slow down quite a bit and require a lot more throttle to take off again. So this test probably is one of the reasons why my mental model is convinced that hydrofoils and ground effect vehicles are a bad combo. Fast forward 7 years later, and here we are with the version 2 of the flying sled. This one I made specifically for ground effect vehicle testing. As you can see, it does its job extremely well. It's even the only RC ground effect vehicle that I know to exist in the whole wide world that can take off from the water, but can't actually fly out of ground effect like a normal airplane, if the thrust is limited to the exact right amount, that is. So this is such a fantastic and stable aircraft that I thought it would be a great platform to use for hydrofoil testing. There are two types of hydrofoils that I want to try. The first is a fully submerged foil. These stay fully submerged under the surface of the water and usually require an actively stabilized control system for stability. The second type is surface piercing foils. These enter the water like a V and are thought to be more stable since they can have dihedral like an airplane wing. So let's start building. The biggest challenge here is going to be making the hydrofoils have as little drag as possible. This is extremely important because water is about 800 times more dense than air, so it's much more difficult to make something move fast through it. To keep drag down, I want to make the foils as thin as possible while still being strong enough not to bend. This is why I chose to make them out of high carbon stainless steel. The primary purpose of these bars is for making knife blades, so they're super stiff. To form them into an airfoil, I just went to town with an angle grinder, slowly but surely abrading them down to the right shape. Then once the shape was close, I switched to a finer grinding wheel, and then eventually sandpaper to really smooth them out. To make the T-shape of the submerged foil, I had Ethan here try MIG welding the two bars together, but that really didn't work out super well. I really probably needed to TIG weld these with stainless steel filler rod, but oh well. The MIG welding wasn't pretty, but it worked well enough. After quite a bit more sanding and grinding, I arrived at something that seemed like it would be pretty dang hydrodynamic. I had basically just made a T-shaped knife. The trailing edge was super sharp. To mount this foil on the flying sled, I 3D printed a holder on my new Creality Ender 3 S1 Plus 3D printer. The vertical bar slides right into the slot and is clamped in with some bolts on either sides. I glued this onto the leading edge of the flying sled and set the angle of attack so that it matched the air wing. This is so that hopefully the transition from foiling to flying was as seamless as possible with minimal change in pitch. It was then ready for the first test. Let's hope we don't hit a fish. The water conditions were far from optimal on this day. The surface was pretty bumpy, but despite that I was still able to get a feel for how it worked. The first thing I noticed is that having the foil so far forward really took a toll on yaw stability. Even with the flight controller using its gyros and accelerometers constantly adjusting the rudder and differential thrust to stabilize the yaw axis, it was still a bit squirrely. The whole reason why I put the hydrofoil on so far forward in the first place was for pitch stability. Think about it like this. The hydrofoil is underwater generating lift. If it's pushing the nose upwards, this is going to cause the plane to pitch up and as a result, go up. Once the foil leaves the water, there will no longer be a force pushing the nose up, so the plane will pitch down and as a result, go down. Then the cycle repeats. This is a self-stabilizing feedback loop that should hold the airplane at just the right altitude for flight in the ground effect. So that's one benefit of the forward hydrofoil placement. But another thing to consider is that even though it's super smooth, the hydrofoil in the water still has a lot of drag relative to the air. This drag is effectively pushing backwards way below the CG, which causes the plane to pitch down. By moving the foil forwards, having it push up on the nose will help to counteract this negative pitching moment caused by having the foil so far below the center of gravity. Despite the yaw stability issues, the flying sled was still able to do its thing fairly well. As you can see, the foil just kind of dives in and out of the water as the plane moves along. Here's what happens when you accidentally flip a switch the wrong direction and cause the motors to pivot up instead of down. Oh, the Insta360 is gone. No! 
So I opened the log on the computer and I'm gonna see if I can find the spot where it crashed. It crashed right about here. So I need to get the coordinates of that point somehow. I then plugged in the coordinates to my phone and fashioned myself a little plastic bin with an anchor and got ready to go swim around in the poop. Ugh, there's a lot of weeds. I hate lake weeds. Now for a word about the sponsor of this video, Established Titles. One thing you probably didn't know about me is that I'm actually an official Scottish Lord, just like Lord Farquaad. I didn't get this title for my prestigious purebred Scottish heritage. Nope. Instead, I got it by purchasing one square foot of land in Scotland. Their rules say that if you own any amount of land, you're officially a lord or a lady. You could even officially change your name if you wanted. But to be honest, I didn't do it for the prestige of being a lord. I did it for the environmental benefits. Purchasing land through established titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. Not only will your plot be preserved forever, but they also plant a tree for every order they get. They work with the charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to help with global reforestation. You will receive an official certificate with a unique plot number that you can use to see the exact location of your land. This all makes for an amazing holiday gift, and they are even having a massive sale that includes 10% off any purchase. Click on the link in the description and use promo code RC10 to help restore the forests of the earth and get some great bragging rights while you're at it. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot. If a bunch of you become a lord or lady, we can make our own little RC test flight kingdom. Thanks again to Established Titles for sponsoring this video. Wow, it's really shallow. I tried to position my location on top of the pin as closely as possible, and then dropped the anchor on my makeshift barge so that I would have a reference point to search around. Then I started rummaging around through the weeds in search of the little bean-shaped camera. After about 15 minutes of swimming around, right as I was starting to get way too cold, I finally found it. As it was sitting on the bottom, it got visited by a little tiny fish and even got some shots of the flying sled passing by overhead. Looking at the onboard footage, we can see that the foil is kind of just acting like a planing surface rather than a hydrofoil. But testing it in such bumpy water is kind of unfair, so we'll have to look at that more closely later. Another obvious thing is that the hydrofoil is catching quite a lot of lake weeds. I was having this problem on my last hydrofoil project, too. There were a bunch of comments saying I should make the leading edge of the foils sharp to cut through the lake weeds, but I think that's a bad idea for two reasons. One is that the craft isn't really going fast enough to actually cut them, even if the leading edge was razor sharp. Another is that having a sharp leading edge on an airfoil or hydrofoil can actually create more drag than a rounded leading edge. This is because the foil needs to be able to work at varying angles of attack. In the front of an airfoil's leading edge, there is actually a stagnation point right where the air splits. This stagnation point stays perfectly aligned with the oncoming air even when the angle of attack changes. With a sharp leading edge, there is no stagnation point that changes with angle of attack, so if the wing is at any non-zero angle of attack, the air will be forced to make a sharp direction change, which causes drag. At extreme angles of attack, you also get flow separation on the top of the leading edge. This is all only true about subsonic flight. At supersonic speeds, air behaves very differently, and sharp leading edges are actually good. So that's why we can't have sharp hydrofoils. The next day, I set out to try and find some smoother water with less weeds. I also increased the yaw stabilization gains to try and make it easier to control. Once again, the foil seemed to be more content riding on the surface of the water versus underneath the water. It only really went underneath at lower speeds. Another issue is that unless the vertical portion of the hydrofoil was facing directly into the oncoming water, the flow would separate away from the leading edge and cause ventilation, which would even creep down to the lifting surface part of the foil. Ventilation is when air pockets get sucked down along the foil and kind of cling to it. This is really bad because it significantly reduces the lift. Typically, ventilation is only a big problem with surface piercing foils, not submerged foils like this one. But even when a submerged foil is constantly going in and out of the water, ventilation becomes much more of an issue. The only time it doesn't seem to be a big issue is when the aircraft starts from a low speed and then accelerates and immediately takes off. But oh wait, this never happens because so long as the hydrofoil is fully submerged, the aircraft never has enough speed to take off. It's only able to build up enough speed if the foil is planing on the surface. By just holding this hydrofoil in the water, we can get a really good feel for how it behaves. There's very little drag at slow speeds. We're going like two meters per second right now. It makes a lot of lift when I increase the angle of attack, but it's really interesting how the lift just gets killed when there's ventilation like that. You see how there's air pockets trapped under there around the foil? That just ruins all the lift. 
It has a lot of turning power, that's for sure, when you change the yaw. Yeah, wow, look at that. Perfect example of ventilation. There's really hardly any drag at all. I, I can just hold it by the tip. Wow, wee, look at that. A plane cut a line right through the clouds. That's crazy. So today I moved the hydrofoil back quite a ways. It used to be right up here on the leading edge, and now I moved it way back there. So we'll see if that fixes some of the yacht instability issues. By moving the hydrofoil backwards, I really didn't notice a big improvement in yaw stability, which was interesting. I did notice that it was slightly easier to keep the foils fully submerged, or at least it would just stay submerged for longer when it was transitioning in between displacement mode and flight. But this isn't necessarily a good thing, because as I said earlier, it seems the foils have less drag when they're planning on the surface. So yeah, the hydrofoil is proving out to not really be all that useful. In order to actually have the foils stay underwater like they're supposed to, you would definitely need a rangefinder with an altitude control loop to automatically control the vehicle's height. It's just not possible for a human to do, at least not at this small scale and with such a small margin of error. There's less lift than I thought just trying to plane on the surface. It definitely lifts a little bit, but less than I thought it would. I can definitely feel more drag when it's just planing on the surface. Then once again, I accidentally flipped the motor switch the wrong direction and ended up floating upside down. Look at that thing, it's driving itself <laughs> in circles. It's probably trying to be in return to home mode. Okay, this is gonna be kind of sketchy to make it stop. <laughs> Wow, well, the autopilot seems to still work. Okay, I don't want to pop my kayak with this hydrofoil because it's a knife. Wow, they got a crane on their barge. Wow, that is the cutest little tugboat I've ever seen. They've got the whole fleet of construction vessels coming through. Look at that. Luckily, none of the electronics on the flying sled were damaged, so I was able to use it again for testing the surface piercing foils. I decided to make these out of aluminum bar instead, just because I ran out of steel. After quite a bit of grinding, I arrived at a nice flat bottom airfoil shape. And then to smooth them out, I sanded with finer and finer sandpaper up until 600 grit. They ended up looking pretty nice and smooth. These ones ended up being quite a bit thicker than the steel foils, so hopefully that doesn't increase drag too much. I then fired up my new Snapmaker 3D printer and printed some brackets that the hydrofoils bolt onto, and then these got glued onto the bottom of the flying sled. I mounted these closer to the CG. Since they don't stick down as far, they shouldn't have as much effect on the pitch. It was pretty clear right away that these things had a lot of drag. It took quite a bit more power to build up speed to take off, and yaw stability wasn't much better than the submerged foil. From the onboard footage, you can see that there was pretty much nothing but ventilation going on with these foils. I think this is kind of inevitable with surface piercing foils at super high speeds relative to their cord length. Sure, you could add some little fences to try and prevent air from traveling down the foil, but that's just going to increase drag, which it already has way too much of, even with no ventilation going on. So all in all, hydrofoils on RC ground effect vehicles? Eh, I'd give it a 2 out of 10. Would not recommend to a friend. To most people, it probably does seem like the two would be a great combination because we've all been told that hydrofoils and ground effect vehicles are both very efficient. If you've ever researched hydrofoil efficiency, you've probably seen a graph like this that compares two hull designs. It shows total drag on the vertical axis and speed on the horizontal axis. We can clearly see that foil borne lift is more efficient than a planing hull at medium speeds. However, all this changes a lot when we're talking about a ground effect vehicle that also gets lift from wings. I couldn't find any real data on this, but here's the general feel I got from my experiments. As we start to accelerate faster and faster, the hydrofoils lift off and become more efficient than a planing hull. As we go even faster, the ground effect vehicle's wing starts to generate aerodynamic lift. This reduces some induced drag from the hydrofoil, but it's still fully submerged, so you're stuck with a lot of parasitic drag. The planing hull, on the other hand, gets lifted out of the water so it's just barely skimming the surface. This is more efficient than having to drag an entire hydrofoil through the water. Then once you do take off, you're stuck with the added drag and weight of the hydrofoils. As I've been working on this project, the company Regent has been doing the initial test flights of a small-scale prototype of their sea glider. Eventually, they hope to sell full-scale versions of this craft to be used for coastal transportation purposes. And what do you know, it has hydrofoils. Before I comment on those, I'll comment on the aircraft in general. They are clearly marketing it as a ground effect vehicle. And if you're making a ground effect vehicle, why on earth would you put the wings as far away from the ground as possible? It doesn't make any sense to me. 
Look at every other ground effect vehicle ever. They all have their wings as low as possible to take advantage of the ground effect as much as possible. You really want your trailing edge to basically be on the surface of the water. So I would not call this thing a ground effects vehicle at all. It's just a cool, nice looking electric seaplane that flies low. I don't necessarily think this graph is scientifically accurate, but with Regent's high wing design, they're going to be operating way down here in the sub 10% efficiency gain region, whereas something like the ATTK Aqua Glider or the Gunter Jurg Airfoil Flare Boat is probably operating way up here at like 50% efficiency increase or more. But then again, Regent's high aspect ratio wing might make up for the efficiency loss from not having the wing super low to the ground. Not sure. And their design is not completely reliant on being super low to the water like the airfoil flare boat, so this will allow them to operate over rougher water. But anyways, onto the hydrofoil part of it. Hydrofoil lift and stability start to rapidly degrade right around 60 miles an hour. This is the speed at which they start to cavitate. Cavitation is when the pressure over the foil gets so low that the water actually starts to boil and turn into vapor. Vapor is much less dense than water, so it causes the foil to lose a lot of its lift, and unsteady cavity dynamics can cause serious pitch and roll instability, and also large increases in drag. So the Regent Sea Glider either needs to take off and land at under 60 miles an hour, or just rely on its big wings and tail for stability and lift at speeds over 60 miles an hour, and just power through the increased drag. Now, one of the big design elements they talk about is a blown wing. They claim that having motors all along the leading edge will maintain lift and control at slow speeds. So if that works, it could help them take off and land at under 60 miles an hour. But 60 miles an hour is still super slow for a plane with a 65 foot wingspan, which is what their full scale model will have. So that's a big challenge. Another reason why hydrofoils can be challenging on an aircraft is that as they near the surface of the water, they create less lift than they did when they were deeper. So now you have to deal with this non-linearity in foil borne lift as the aircraft takes off. If that's not enough, hydrofoils also have a very narrow speed range in which they operate effectively. Airplanes, on the other hand, operate over a very wide speed range. This can vary greatly based on wind speed, direction, and payload weight. So it's difficult to match airspeed at the plane with the optimal foiling speed. So there you have it, a bunch of reasons why not to use hydrofoils on aircraft. But there's also a big reason why to use hydrofoils on aircraft, and that is that there really isn't a better option. One of the reasons why ground effect vehicles haven't become popular is that they can't really handle choppy water at all. Hydrofoils could really help make takeoffs and landings much smoother, but then I think the hydrofoils would need to be retracted so that the aircraft can fly lower to the surface to utilize ground effect more effectively. For normal seaplanes, one of the big downsides has always been that the hulls have had to have been made super strong to withstand the huge amounts of force from waves hitting them on takeoffs and landings. This adds a ton of weight to the airframe, making the plane less efficient. One interesting example of having to deal with this problem was the F-2Y Sea Dart. It was an amphibious fighter jet that needed water skis to take off and land. This was to prevent the fuselage from hitting waves at high speed. If implemented correctly, hydrofoils could help seaplanes with rough waters, but aerodynamics and hydrodynamics don't always scale down very well. So at RC scale, the concept is really difficult to make work, and kind of impractical in my opinion. So I strongly prefer my flying sled to have no hydrofoils. It just works so much better that way. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye. In 2022, Daniel built something new, Hydro. Hydrofoil Slicing through the waves with these Maximum efficiency Hydro Hydrofoil Come on Arju pilot do it Turn that sonar into movement Stabilize that little boat It doesn't even need to float I don't know man, it might have sank <laughs> Should have put two water bottles on it. There was a single water bottle on the drone for buoyancy, but uh don't know if that was enough. We hear beeping. It's somewhere. It's somewhere. We can just barely, barely hear the ESC's beeping. See it. You see it? Is that it? Yeah, I think so. Oh! <laughs> oh yeah, that's definitely it. Oh hell yeah. Dude, it, the water bottle's vibrating. That's how the beeps are coming through. Oh, you're totally right. What? Look at that! <laughs> oh, that's so good! Hello! Oh, that's so good! <laughs> Amazing! We got it! Yes! <laughs> you got a little corrosion there. But it's just, yeah, just a little bit. Other than that, it looks great. <laughs> what the f***, dude? <laughs> nice. <laughs> the, the trusty old inflatable kayak does it again.
Although my taint is pretty wet. It's just a little wet. <laughs> We're slowly sinking. This is what happens when you crash in the parking lot and lose your GoPro nut. <laughs> just gotta tape it on. Brushless motors and propellers, so much swag, this ship is stellar. Screw your yacht, it can't even fly, not like my hydrofoil. Ansel's flying the flying sled. How does it feel? It feels great. It's really easy to fly. Woo! <laughs> oh, dog. Uh, does it feel like an FPV drone? No. <laughs> <laughs> what does it feel like? A napkin? <laughs> it does feel it like a napkin. Gets blown around quite a bit. It feels kind of like a kite. Woo! I don't know if you can pull off this turn. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it in uh, ground effects when you're low to the water? Oh, it's epic. It's weird though, because like normally you have control and then you just like start pushing down and nothing, eventually it stops going down and just hovers for you. Yeah, just uh, it's a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop. Come on, flight controller, do it. Remove all unwanted movement made of sticks and foam and glue. 3D printed plastic too. Get rid of all that friction. Satisfy your nerd addiction. Throttle up, full steam ahead. Hydrofoil, f yeah!